Trinity Reformed Church. The last few verses of the 46th Psalm read, Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, worship the Lord. Take refuge in him. Now please turn with me to Habakkuk. Chapter 1, we'll be starting in verse 12. Habakkuk. Chapter 1, verses 12 through chapter 2, verse 4 this morning. Here's the reading of God's Word. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have appointed them for judgment. O rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously? And hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he. Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook, they catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet, because by them their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? I will stand to my watch. And set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end of it, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come and will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Here is the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that our ears would be truly open to your word. My words would contain your truth alone. If I make an error, that the ears would be stopped, that only your truth would be heard, that my words would be pleasing to you, that you would be glorified above all things. Gracious Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we left off last week in Habakkuk, we stopped with the Lord's description of the Babylonians and their army. This morning, we see the prophet's continued cries to the Lord after hearing what lays before him and God's people. We see Habakkuk almost taken aback by the Lord's pronouncement, reacting in what appears to be total shock. Take note of the deep parallels in this passage, highlighting the prophet's points as we go through it. Look at verse 12 and see where the prophet is coming from. The first thing that jumps out is that though he is in shock, he is grappling with the Lord's judgment by looking at who the Lord is. He reminds himself of who he is, but this remembrance brings him back to the faith that God has given him. But what is he saying there? Specifically, what is he saying in the second line, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? When you look at that phrase, it's important to look at the next line in conjunction with it. We shall not die. It's tempting to think that Habakkuk is talking about his personal God. As he says, my Lord, 
my Holy One. But that's not the case. And is signified by the second statement where the verb turns plural. The Lord is the God of Israel. He is the Holy One of Israel. The Lord has set himself apart to be the God of his chosen people, of a people set apart to glorify him. He's not the God of the individual. He's not the God of the prophet. He is the Lord, God Almighty of his people and has set himself apart for them, made himself holy for them. In other words, he's put himself into a special relationship with them, including his mercy and special revelation. That's his word, the, the Bible. Listen to the words of God as found in Exodus chapter 4. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You may speak of God as our Lord, but you must never forget that he is the Holy One of his chosen people. And this needs to be taken to heart as we read these words. For it's not your personal interpretation that is his word. It isn't how the Bible makes you feel. It isn't what a passage means to you today. It's about his revelation as he means it and gives it to us. And so we have to interpret Scripture with Scripture. Not Scripture with the ideas of man, but Scripture with the ideas, with the words of God rather than seeking for our own new understanding. And so we read that because the Lord has set himself apart for his people, that we, his people, shall not die. His people cannot die. He cannot put up with death. The question is, who are his people? Because of the special relationship, the Lord requires a special purity for his people, just as Christ Jesus proclaimed, therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. In this verse, we see the prophet talking about Judah and Israel, who have failed to live up to the requirements set by God, failed to put their trust in him, or to even try to follow God. And so his judgment is set upon those who think they are his people. He has appointed it and marked them down for correction, even destruction. The Lord corrects those who he loves and has a relationship with them, but those he hates <clears throat> suffer the destruction of his wrath. In our text today, you will see the term correction and corrected used twice in verse 12. And then, again, in uh, chapter 2, verse 1, in the New King James Version. But the words mean two very different things. It's stated differently in the King James Version, but it doesn't really help clarify what's going on here. In chapter 2, it means what it says, to be corrected or reproved. But in verse 12, it comes from a root word meaning to be in the sunshine. And in a way, it is the way it's written means to prove or to show, to shine a light on. So what we're seeing is a correction or punishment, yes, but it is also more akin to making an example out of them, showing them for who they are, that they deserve what they're getting. God is shedding light upon their disobedience. 
only those that hate the light and want to hide in the darkness out into the light of day. The rock that is the unchangeable God of our salvation, the Almighty, has marked them for punishment. The words judgment and correction come with the connotation of chastening, of bringing his people back under the rule of God's strength and law since they would not fall under his rule through the law and the prophets. Then they will do so under the might of an almighty God who uses a mighty and violent nation as a tool for his purposes. You get to decide how you will conduct yourself before God as you encounter his sovereignty. But you cannot escape that sovereignty. For every knee shall bow to his throne, willingly or unwillingly. As we move into verse 13, we see that the first two lines have to do with looking upon wickedness. And the verbs there for look have the idea of passively looking on as evil occurs. In essence, he's saying, Lord, you are so pure, you can't just stand by and watch this evil occur, can you? Then why do you allow this evil to take place? It's almost like Habakkuk is accusing God of standing by with his cell phone, videoing these evil deeds rather than doing something to stop them. Haven't we all wanted to ask the Lord, why do you let these things happen to good people, to your people? But we also see a transition here or an expansion to include Babylon. Habakkuk is asking the Lord, why do you allow such an evil people to devour the more righteous Judah? And in one respect, it's true that Judah is more righteous and that they are chosen by God and set apart as a holy nation. But in another, of course, they are not. For they have turned aside. They've turned their back on the Lord. They have forsaken his covenant with them. Listen to the beginning of the 14th Psalm. It says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there, there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Judah wasn't righteous. No more than you or I are righteous. Apart from the righteousness of Christ. Is imputed to us through faith in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Without his righteousness, we're lost. And so they are made like the fish of the sea, drawn up by hooks and nets. The point he's making here is that man is made helpless, unable to save himself. Verse 14 spells it out, and then verse 15 elaborates upon the situation. There are two things happening here. First, you have the fish. They're hiding there in their own world, thinking that they're safe from harm, that nothing can touch them. Much like the men of Judah, thinking that they were safe because God would protect them no matter what they did or what they worshipped. They think that they're secure. They will be safe, never touched, and yet they're plucked out of their safe place. They're taken away. And then we see the mention of being like the creeping things without a ruler. This speaks to the anarchy and chaos of a lack of rule, of the lack of law and civility. Where there is no rule, where there is no authority, there is helplessness and destruction. The Caesars of Rome, Hitler, 
And every other ruler that persecuted the Jews or Christians was put in place by God. He was given power, the power of the sword over the people, and we are better off with them. Better off than with no leader at all, even with the vilest of leaders. It's something that's so hard to comprehend, something very hard to put up with. Sometimes we forget that terrible rule is better than no rule at all. But then Habakkuk had forgotten what had led the Lord to remove his favor from the people. The kings of Israel and Judah were getting worse and worse with only a few shining examples of faith in the lines of the kings. And those only in the kingdom of Judah once we see the split of the kingdoms. Near the end of the kingdom of Judah, we come to the account of Manasseh's reign in 2 Kings. Listen to the abhorrence, the wickedness and evil of this king. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. He raised up altars for Baal. He made a wooden image as Ahab, king of Israel, had done, and he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. He also built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Also, he made his son pass through the fire, practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, and consulted spiritists and mediums. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image of Asherah that he had made in the house of which the Lord had sent to David and to Solomon his son in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not make the feet of Israel wander any more from the land which I gave their fathers only if they are careful to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded me. But they paid no attention, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spoke by his servant and the prophets, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, has done these abominations, he has acted more wickedly than all the Amorites who were before them, and has also made Judah sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such calamity upon Jerusalem and Judah that whoever hears of it, both his ears will tingle. That's from 2 Kings chapter 21. This passage needs no explanation to make your skin crawl at the evil that was taking place in God's holy land, in God's temple, where he had set his name perpetrated by the Holy One's own people and their leader, no less. He was practicing human sacrifice, partaking of fertility cults, making his own gods out of wood and gold, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. And the people were following him, including the priests. How else would he be placing idols within the courts of the temple. The Lord is a jealous and righteous God, and he will not stand rebellion from his people forever, let alone blatant enmity. And so he made them this helpless fish caught in a net, set adrift in the world to be exalted from their safe, or excuse me, exiled from their safe haven. Then the vision of the prophet moves on to the Babylonians who worship their might and their ability, who make sacrifices to their nets, to their tools, their weapons of conquest. Is it really any different today? 
Are the Babylonians any different than the nations of today? Are they different than our nation? Are we any different than Judah? Were we ever truly a godly nation? I was reading a book just the other day about the hospice chaplaincy, which is a ministry that is, has to serve all belief systems without prejudice. And yet, the Christian chaplain must do so without compromising his faith, his belief, and his witness in and for Jesus Christ. We have to be ready in season and out of season to share the gospel, to share the word of God. And yet this Christian chaplain wrote a regular prayer life achieved by a process of focusing of or centering can be provided by means provide the means to reach a selfless love and concern for others. That sounds good, right? Centering involves regular meditation concerning our efforts on the God within each of us. A little bit of a problem there. And we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but that's not what he's talking about. Talking about being a God unto himself. We live in a time when freedom of religion is coming to mean all religions are equally valid. Are we really that far from the Baals and the Astral Rocks? We trust in our might and our technology just as the Babylonians did. And we don't have anything to say about it. We walk around as a prideful people, and we ignore God. If we don't have our own riches, we worship those who are rich and powerful. We build altars to them as people. We put their heads on coins and bills, and the leaders feel no guilt or shame. Nothing seems to ever change. Man refuses to acknowledge God. I'm a fan of the writings of Mark Twain. He was a man wise in the ways of the world, sadly not in the ways of God. But he understood the world we mind all too well. Listen to these quotations written well over 100 years ago. Like all other nations, we worship money and the possessors of it. They being our aristocracy. We like to read about rich people in papers. The papers know it, and they do their best to keep his, this appetite liberally fed. Rich woman fell down cellar, not hurt. The falling down the cellar is of no interest to us when the woman is not rich. But no rich woman can fall down the cellar, and we not yearn to know all about it and wish it was us. He also wrote, wrote excuse me, wrote, when speaking of the motto, in God we trust. There was never a nation in the world that put its whole trust in God. I think I, it would be better read within certain judicious limitations, we trust in God. And if there isn't enough room on the coin for this, why enlarge the coin? Have you really gotten that far from the NASA? Have we changed much since the days of Mark Twain? His words ring very true, don't they? Maybe all we've done is just cleaned up our act enough to make it look a little nicer. Clothing our gods in glitter rather than carving them out of wood or stone or metal. We print them on paper. Paper made of wood. Look at the tabloids covering the shelves at every check stand at the grocery store. Look at the reality shows on television whose only purpose is to look inside the glamorous or sordid life of some family or individual just because they happen to have made a record or done something preposterous and have a lot of money. How many times has Jennifer Aniston going to be on the cover of some tabloid in our lifetime? And then the people pay lip service to the Lord, saying they believe in a God or a higher power. 
They say, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I still don't know what that means. We cry for repentance and we get branded a, few, a fool, accused of being dangerous fanatics because we believe in Christ. And yet, the wicked devour a person more righteous than they. And we have to cry, my Lord, my one, why is this so? the wicked prosper? Why does the glutton reign supreme? But that's when we have to stand with the prophet and post ourselves on the ramparts. Figuratively, he is setting himself up to wait upon the Lord, to see what the Lord will do. Look at the Lord's answer. He tells Habakkuk to write it down in plain, easy language, so that it will be easily understood by those who read it. And there is some evidence that tablets were posted in the temple area to be read, and this may be what is spoken of here. And what does the Lord say? Wait. Wait, the appointed time will come. The Lord is sure and does not lie. The vision is sure and true, and there is a time appointed for it to come to pass. Look at verse 4. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by faith. In humility, Habakkuk waits to see how the Lord will correct him. And only then will he answer the Lord. Once again, we see that it is perfectly right to ask the Lord for clarification. It's perfectly right to say why. To come to him with honest questions of concern about your personal life or of the nation or of the world. It is then that you have to wait upon the Lord. It is then that you have to look to his word. It's then that you have to earnestly pray and be still and know that he is God. You need to watch in patience and look how the Lord begins. He answers with mercy and reassurance that the unrighteous will suffer punishment, but the just shall live by faith. John the Baptist, speaking in John chapter 3, states, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. Life is found through faith. There has never been another way to be right with God. There is only one way to be right with God. And this is not a case of all roads lead to God. Salvation cannot be gained by might. It cannot be gained by knowledge of man. It cannot be gained by being a good person cannot be gained by worshiping some idol. It can only be yours through faith in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. There's no man that we can worship. There's no man that we can lift up except for the God-man, Jesus Christ, fully human and fully God who came here for us to carry our sins to the cross. Where are you putting your faith? Where does your God reside? Is it the check stand? Is it on late night TV? Is it in your wallet? Or is it dwelling in your heart? Because Christ die for your sins, and you believe in his holy name, and his spirit dwells within you and opens up his word for the truth that it is. For the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 
For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. We'll leave you with the 46th Psalm. It reads, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and Though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Rest in the Lord. There is no other way to be right with him. There is no other way to live but through Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for being our refuge and our strength. Father, you are our ever-present help. Lord, we ask that our faith would never waver. That even when we feel those doubts, Lord, that you would wipe them away, that our zeal would be for you and you alone. We would live for you. That we would carry your word, your grace, your love out into the world that the world might know. Might know who you are. Might know that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ. That their sins too might be forgiven. Send us out to love you to serve you with all we are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, in believing that you may, be, may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go out now to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.